Hi, everybody. It's Nancy Reyes with For Your Canine. And Joanne Soiki with For Better, For Worse. Lisa Batasco with Canine Defined. Today, we are going to uh, talk with uh, Tracy Zuniga about Canine Fitness today. And so let us know you're there. And uh, if you have questions, we're going to, it's a very broad topic, uh, but a topic that's pretty important to me uh, personally, as well as um, in my work and everything. I see a lot of behavior cases and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not a behavior problem at all. It's an actual fitness or a, a physical problem. So I'm very, very passionate about uh, understanding the dog's physical uh, issues and also and also uh, in in res regard to dog sports being able to uh, give them the right foundation for that too physically to be able to do whatever sports we choose um, because it's just because a lot of people think depending on the sport that they should because the dog likes to jump on the couch or jump on stuff that they should be able to do agility and it'll be great right and unfortunately it doesn't work like that um mm -hmm. so i I have been very uh, <clears throat> kind of pushing uh, more canine fitness and having people understand more. So much so that um, Tracy is now uh, is um, is a, a certified. I'm sorry, Tracy. What is your certification again? I'm, I know what it is, but I can't remember. It. <laughs> certified canine athletic specialist. Right, and so I asked her to uh, start teaching classes at my facility because. I think it's so important for people to understand it more. And she does uh, a really great job of getting, uh, having, helping people understand the physical part of the dog uh, and, and giving them the right information and exercises to be able to um, do whatever sport you ask. And I, I know Lisa um, has done some, uh, a lot of physical uh, work too. Um, did you did you I know you're you're a massage therapist I, which I am as well but I haven't I haven't practiced it so Lisa did you do a certification for that I've done I've worked on the certification but life as always steps in the way and uh, yes, sister. <laughs> right now my priority is my mother so yeah um, I am um, but you did but this was a while back that you were I started doing stuff yeah last okay. last year but last year oh okay I thought it was longer than that mm -hmm. No, I've been doing the massage prior to that and then learning more about the physical stuff oh, okay. and trying to identify an appropriate, because um, there's so many, you know, as we know, like as trainers, there are like so many certifications out there that you want to investigate to determine what actually suits your sure. beliefs and so forth. So, sure. yeah, yeah, no, I, I just was, because um, I know <laughs> we, um, we try to, um, you know, and you're right. There's a lot of a lot of them out there. So, Tracy, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in canine, um, the the canine fitness piece of it? Yeah. So, um, actually, almost a year and a half ago, um, my uh, miniature schnauzer, she was two and a half at the time, jumped off our back deck, which is only three steps. Um, but in the process of doing so, she dislocated all three metatarsal hawks in her left uh, back leg. Um, it just so kind of happened that uh, I've been grooming for many, many years and needed to uh, move into something a little bit different and wanting to stay in the dog world um, and really through grooming have seen so many overweight pets and pets that really physically could be better off um, and to prevent more injuries like what I was going through, even though she's not overweight or anything, but that physical piece was not there. Um, so Nancy actually had Erica Bowling on um, doing a thing for Northeast Canine Conditioning, which is where I got my start. Um, I did her, uh, it's about a six month long program. And then she still is a mentor for me for what I'm doing for Nancy, as far as classes and private lessons. Um, through what I learned um, through Erica and the program, though, I was able to 100% um, heal my miniature schnauzer through um, exercises, strength, strength, st strength, strength, st sorry, strength training, training. Why can't I? <laughs> no, no. Say that 10 times real fast. <laughs> um, 
And um, she was able to heal without having a plate put in her hock. Um, and I worked with a surgeon uh, very dedicatedly and got um, through a whole bunch of exercises with her to regain that strength and muscle tone. Um, and now she's back to barn hunting and nose work and fast cat and everything she loves. Um, but at that point, I really vowed to help as many dogs in the athletic and mainly the dogs that are at home doing they really kind of, you know, nothing or, you know, your dogs that we just play fetch with in the backyard, but are a little bit overweight. Those are the most susceptible to your CCL and your ACL. And then working into um, the sports world and, uh, you know, with Nancy and agility and nose work um, and barn hunt and just making sure that all the dogs that are participating are really sound dogs and doing the best we can to prevent injury and to make them as healthy as possible. So here I am. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, because I, I, especially um, back in the day when with agility, it's one of those sports everybody wants to get into it, and they think, oh, my dog can jump; they should be able to um, do agility. And it's like that's not really the case. They really need to be conditioned, and and um, and overweight is is what I see the most. Do you do you agree, you guys, jo uh, Joanne, Lisa? Yes. Yep. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And 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 I'll be honest, as a dog trainer trying to tell your a client that uh, their dog is overweight, it's like it's almost like telling them they're fat. So it's really it, it's a it's a very delicate little Well, I think a lot of it too is society, right? Like food is love. That's yes you know, and that's crazy, yeah. crazy, but I think it's true. I mean like Yeah, and, and so yeah, it's 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 a it's a delicate uh delicate uh, position that we're in when some of the, some of the problems are because a dog is um, unfortunately overweight or um, can't do certain things because of their weight or people think nothing of taking a very overweight dog and doing agility with it. So, uh, <laughs> which or any is any other sport <laughs> yeah, or, or, or any other sport. Um, and um, so we're going to today, we're going to really focus on more pet dogs and all that. But the other thing I wanted to uh, uh, talk about it, um, I mean, there's, there's, this is a really, really big, vast topic, uh, but it's one of those things that we wanted to kind of just bring stuff to for you to think about and really uh, consider, right? Uh, um. So anyway, I really wanted to um, kind of address those kind of things. So, um, uh, so uh, Tracy's kind of come up with a little bit of a slide presentation. So we're going to go in there, and then if you guys can, if you have any questions or whatever, we'll kind of take them as they come in, and then we'll um, we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. So if you want to go to the not the next slide. Okay. So um, this week, especially in the, actually the last two weeks, um, even in my class, uh, we did a lot about heat stroke and um, warming up and cooling down your dog, which is the um, biggest things for injury prevention, especially in the sport dogs and even your dogs at home, um, you know, doing a little warm up and cool down before you go out for a run or play fetch um, will really help. Um, warm up and cool down your dog's muscles so they don't constrict and become tight. Um, a little bit though, just signs of heat stroke is kind of what we started with. Um, basically, it was perfect topic. We got really, really hot these last two weeks. Um, Tell me about it. Also working for a vet clinic, uh, we had a lot of um, not so great uh, heat stroke dogs come in. So it was something that was dear to me and that needed to be touched on. Um, you know, this weekend, you know, we're out doing fast cat or, you know, whatever you guys are doing, making sure that your dog is actually warming up and cooling down properly is really important. Um, and knowing the actual signs of heat stroke. Um, so I kind of made this little diagram for you. Um, just run right through it. Um, seizures, dizziness, signs of confusion, your dog, you know, walking around like they're drunk, don't really have much balance vomiting, heavy panting, excessive drooling, changing the gum color. It's going to go from a really, um, it's going to get darker and darker and darker red, and then it'll get real pale. Um, a racing heart rate. Um, 
I mean, you take a dog's heart rate, at least it's pulse. You can the same way you do yourself, uh, count the heartbeats. You can put your hand on the um, left hand side of the chest and count the heartbeats for 10 seconds, multiply it by six. You're looking for anywhere between 90 to 110, anything higher. They're really going to be racing, um, collapsed and staggering. Diarrhea, um, diarrhea with uh, blood or mucus is a real big sign you need to get to a vet now. Um, and then body temperature. Um, anybody, something I really encourage um, is a first aid kit and making sure that you have a dog labeled thermometer with you at all times, whether you're out uh, traveling or at a sports event for the day or in your first aid kit and then one at home also. So it's always relative readily available. Mm. Uh, well, and actually, you know, um, I, it's interesting that you start with this because I was at my the vet earlier in the week and she said we, they had so many cases of uh, heat stroke and unfortunately um, uh, some of them were not very, the outcome was not good. Right. Um, and this is something that the the, ha the owner did. They were outside playing in 90 degrees with, the, mm -hmm. with their dog. It's like it's like it doesn't take much to to go there. It was a young dog and it, it didn't survive, so it's uh it's it's rough. So it's like you really you don't want to be a helicopter, you know, kind of like me, but you definitely want to consider. <laughs> well, right, and I mean you don't you know you walk really early, six o'clock in the morning, you know, eight nine o'clock at night, and even now eight nine o'clock at night is still not cooling off um, as much as it really could be, but. Um, you know, there's, that's why, you know, I, one of the reasons why I really love nose work is because I can throw out some boxes, put some hides in a room and tire out my dogs without having to go outside and run them um, or, you know, play fetch or uh, stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, at the vet clinic this week, it was the same thing. It was that's insane. Really and in the excuses were just, you know, well, what else am I supposed to do with them? So uh -huh. there's definitely options. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> and yeah, it's definitely something to uh, consider for sure. Right. Right. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. Um, this kind of goes along with the uh, heat stroke is hydration. And again, this goes for conditioning. Um, just like us, you need ample amount of uh, hydration and water in your body for your muscles to constrict and move properly in the fascia that runs along the outside of the muscles, which is between the muscle and the skin to um, fluidly, it's kind of like on a, um, it's on a slide and it moves really nicely when it's hydrated. And if it gets a little um, dehydrated, it starts to kind of rub. And that's where you have that uh, little bit of muscle issue and constriction going on. Um, so I just wrote up a little um, importance of hydration. Um, obviously it's the purpose to carry important nutrients into and out of the cells of the body, aiding in digestion and the absor absorption of nutrients. It also regulates body temperature. It's one of the um, key things that helps regulate body temperature. Not only, you know, when you're going to go out and you're looking for con uh, conditioning, you're looking to make sure that they are hydrated because if they're not, then you're not going to get well performance out of them. You're not going to get good movement out of them and um, they're gonna cool down really quick. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to take longer for them to cool down without that because you're gonna have so much more friction. Um, it lubricates joints, improves cognitive function and it cushions the brain and spinal cord. Every part of your dog requires water, whether you're um, you know, out and about. So let me ask you a question. Yep. So the the hydration, you know, drinking water. How about like cooling coats and all that stuff? Yeah. So cooling coats are a great thing. Cooling mats. Um, my wire hair visa will lay on a cooling mat just in my house. Um, you know, some dogs lay on air conditioned vents. I keep two cooling mats out in my house, not in the sun. And he will lay on those um, if he's hot or if he's been outside to go to the bathroom, he'll come in and he'll lay on those. Um, also taking like a squirt bottle. So if your dog isn't actually willing to drink out of a bottle when, you know, or out of a bowl when you need them to, or when you think they're dehydrated, carrying a squirt bottle with you that's got cold water in it and just raising um, the lip of 
their muzzle and spraying some water on their gum lines will help tremendously also. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, Aaron Resmer does that like pretty regularly. <laughs> She's yeah. constantly. Yeah, springs there. Crazy. In the confirmation yeah. world, it's pretty common. Uh, you keep a squirt bottle with you because you don't want your dog's beard to get all wet. So it's much easier to keep them hydrated that way. <laughs> okay. I don't know if my, that'd be interesting. I mean, it's something you'd probably have to train for some dogs because it'd be like, eh. Yeah, it definitely. And I mean, I mean, it's not on Pierce. You have it, you know, on whatever the um, mist. Yeah, there we go. Oh, <laughs> the mist is. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Those misters are great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like Ryobi, the sale they just had, uh, they have a Mr. Fan that actually works really good, too. Yeah. Um, um, here's a question. Uh, Nancy was asking about adding electrolytes. What do you think of that? Um, I definitely. So a lot of times um, halfway through your day or halfway through your nose work day or, you know, whatever sport you're doing, you can tell your dog's a little lagging. Um, they make um, like Cala... They're in like a little tube and they're um, electrolytes and they're Cali-Q things. Um, I can get a link for that. Um, absolutely. If you if you can tell your dog is, you know, a little dehydrated or lagging a little bit um, in the middle of your day or halfway through your day, absolutely, I would recommend that. Um, okay, good. Yeah, I was... Um, I, I never usually add anything uh, to uh, my dog's water, so it's interesting. Like, it doesn't even need to be added to their water. Um, so they make it in like a uh, like a squirt tube that you would just give, you know, a little squirt portion into the side of the mouth um, during the day, almost like a treat or food. Um, and it just gives them that extra little boost to get them through whatever you're working on or doing. Oh, it's more common in like the IPO and the uh, bite work and stuff. Oh, okay. Where you're, um, oh, okay. You know, running recommendations for the electrolyte stuff or for people I, or no? Do, do we have recommendations for for electrolyte products to help the dogs or? Um, I will get one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious, you know, because there's so many products out there and like. It's always good to know specifically there's somebody who's had experience with with that. There is one I use. Give me one second. Um, well, uh, I'll move on a little bit, yeah. while Tracy. Um, so one of the important things that people don't do a lot of is uh, warm up and cool down. Uh, myself included sometimes. Um, I forget. So I have to really be um, conscious of that um, to make sure it's uh, good. Uh, Alicia was asking, do you recommend watermelon as a snack for the dog? Yeah, um, I freeze it. it. makes So if you freeze it, it's even better. Um, I will take chunks of it and freeze it, get seedless. Um, <laughs> and uh, those are great treats mm -hmm. for them great uh intake of water most of it is water i heard cantaloupe too is another one mm -hmm. but i guess i guess i was thinking like i get for me i wonder how much the sugar part of it but i guess if you have an active dog that would make sense being appropriate you know what i mean yeah um and you know that's why i would uh the watermelon i would do more over than the cantaloupe um, just because i think watermelon is like 90 something percent water in the first place. Uh, but definitely um, any type of, we uh, freeze um, sometimes like a veggie pur puree um, for good uh, electrolytes and stuff. Um, and just that energy boost that you need during the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so warming up, what's, what are some, I see some of the so um, warming up is really important. Um, the purpose would be to prepare the body for strenuous activity, uh, preventing injury, which is always our main goal. Improve performance. Um, you're warming up the muscles. You're increasing the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and you're increasing metabolic rate, which is what delivers the oxygen to all your muscles and importantly, your uh, the brain of the dog. Um, 10 to 15 minutes of a warm up. Um, and, you know, like 
even agility. So one of the biggest is, you know, even in class, like you're pulling out your dog, going for a 45 second and probably not even that long run as fast as you can and then putting them back in a crate. And sometimes you're taking them out, running them in something somewhere that isn't air conditioned and then putting them back in somewhere that is air conditioned. And this actually uh, came up in my class this week. Um, and how your the dog's body responds to that. So when you do that without any warm up or cooling down, you're taking cold muscles, bursting them into exercise, and then rapidly cooling them down, which is constricting the muscle very tightly. So when you go to take them back out for their second run, they're really tight. Their muscles are constricted. The fascia is rubbing against each other, and that's where you have your injuries happen. Um, so warming up is really important. Even if, you know, during classes, just take that few extra seconds after your run, walk them outside to go to the bathroom or walk them the length of wherever building you're in um, a few times just to let them walk out that burst of energy they just did and to cool back down. Um, warming up beforehand, uh, you can do quick sprints from, you know, a cone to cone. Um, you could play a little bit of tug. You could run to a touch pad. Um, I like, so like at fast cat events, I will put Jarvis on like a 10 foot leash and go out away from everybody else and just kind of lunge him five times around me to one side, five times to the other side, just to really warm him up and get him um, ready to run. And then afterwards I walk him out. Um, but I mean, it could be as simple as a brisk walk, a slow trot, um, just something to get your dog moving for, you know, anywhere for three to five minutes to warm up before you're going to go do that activity that you're there for, whatever you're going to, even if you're going to go play ball, um, you know, do something a little bit less strenuous before you do that so that they can warm up a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest, I'm very guilty. Like in, in agility, I was more conscious of doing that, but now in doing nose work, I don't, I don't do too much warm up. So. Uh, it's a good reminder because I'm, I'm bad. Yeah, about well, and, you know, it depends on, you know, you know where you're um, trialing or class, you know, where class is and all that. But because, I mean, while nose work is a very mental mm -hmm. game, it is physical, too. I mean, it, yeah. the hides can be, you know, high or low or so you've got necks going up and down um, and different things like that. So. Um, and then cooling down is a sudden stop of activity that can create a lot of rapid changes in the body that place undue strain on the heart. Um, so what happens when all those muscles constrict in your body is it's pushing blood from every muscle into the heart, which creates strain on it, opposed to you're gradually coming down, you're gradually lowering, lowering that heart rate. Um, so you want to gradually bring the heart rate down to normal, decrease the intensity of the work and keep your dog moving. One of the biggest things is people don't keep their dogs moving. Um, even if you go from, you know, fast cat running as you know, fast as you can to just walking them out, it's at least cooling them down more than just throwing them back, you know, putting not, not throwing, putting them back in a crate. Mm -hmm. um, be alert to the changes in breathing, the panting color of the inside of the ears. Um, a lot of times, if they're really, really hot or really, really worked up, um, or you just, you know, ran really far, um, the inside of the ears are really red. So watching that come back to like a normal pale skin color, um, alertness and balance of the dog. And then stretching when you're all done for the day, um, making sure that after your cool down, your last cool down that you stretch, um, a good bow is a really nice stretch to for the shoulders and the neck and the um, upper back. Um, there's, you can lure them from the head to the hip and then the hip up and down. I'm sorry, the head up and down. Um, and then getting them to wave actually, even like the highest paw you can get them to do, or some dogs actually will wave um will really help stretch out those shoulders hmm. all right because yeah i i mean i think coming walking back to your car like right in nose work would that be enough because some of the walks back are long yeah and again it's just gauging um you know 
when you leave the um, when you leave the site or your nose work um, area, I mean, look at your watch. What time it is? I would say a two to three minute walk back to your car if it's taking that long would be good um, oh. for you know your agility, your fast cat, your IPO. Um, you're gonna want that you know, a good 10 minutes of a cool down because they literally just sprinted everything they had into 45 seconds to a minute and a half, depending mm -hmm. on what you're doing. Mm, okay. Well, good to know. Um, you can skip that. Uh, <laughs> that was just part, yeah, of, this is, this is part of what you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is that, and I think that's the end. Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. So, um, a uh, question like, I know we were talking about it earlier, um, and I and Lisa actually came up with this slide about uh, the gross plates. Can can um, you guys talk about that a little bit? Like one of the one of the issues that we that we don't. I mean, I know it happens, and we see some of it is um, especially in agility, where people are trying to jump their dogs to at a, at a very young age, and unfortunately. Um, you have to, you know, the growth plates are an important part of the development of the puppy um, and jumping them or damaging them is a, it basically all four legs have a growth plate. And if you, if one of them uh, gets injured, it's going to affect how evenly the dog grows. Right. Am I correct on that? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So basically there are exercises that you can do to warm up and cool your down your dog before the growth plates uh, close and they're going to be all on the ground. They're not really going to use pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, you can warm up your dog by doing, you know, a series of sit down stands um, in any particular order, just proper form, making sure that the dog is square, the back is straight and your hocks are uh, perpendicular to the ground. Um, I at I think Jarvis was 16 months old. I had x-rays done to make sure his growth plates were closed. I know that's a little extreme. I'm kind of on the extreme with Nancy. But uh, <laughs> just to make sure they were before I started really uh, extra, you know, like really doing some heavy core um, tracking and um, hunting and uh, a couple different things with him. More fast cat than I was before. Um, to make sure that he had, could actually handle it um, and that we weren't going to injure any of those pieces still growing. Yeah, um, because I think Lisa brought up a good um, point, like people put their puppies up on things or start to do exercises that maybe are a little more beyond what yeah. you're doing. So the thing, I mean, you put... Um, you know, you see the cute little pictures of puppies up on like a peanut or a balance board or, um, you know, on top of a balance donut and stuff like that. And um, while it's cute and all, uh, the injury rate for putting such a small animal that has no idea about body awareness or balance on something like that is uh, going to be detrimental if they fall. Um, so making sure that you really do start on the ground um, and really working on your your sit and your stand and your down in a correct form um, actually will help in the long run more than just trying to stick them on equipment. Well, I think, I think what's crazy is that um, there has been like, you know, not everybody cares about the fitness part of it. I'm like, mm -hmm. it, and to me, it doesn't make sense because I want my dog to mature and be with me for the longevity, like it's important that they are healthy and stable. Um, I have my dogs checked regularly by um, a chiropractor to assure that what's happening and um, like making sure that they're well muscled and so forth. I've also adjusted, and I'm sure you guys have done the same, Nancy and Joanne, where I've adjusted the way I've teach, I've taught my sits, downs and stands so people understand it, right? Because they don't know because they do the whole rock back sit, which is not necessarily a proper form. Um, and I think people have a hard time understanding that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I personally have stepped back way back from doing any kind of performance work with my dogs 
because I want to make sure that they're physically able to handle it, not just mentally. I think mentally is one aspect of it, but the other part is definitely the physical part of it. So, um, yeah, it became very important to me. Now, that being said, am I great at it? Oh, God, no. <laughs> but And I think that's not the sexy part of training, right? I right. like to train it, but it, I think people don't understand the importance of it. Like, mm -hmm. it's really important, and you can cause lifetime injury to these dogs that never fully heal. And the, the, the physical part of it, like the musculature, it, like, takes forever to heal. And people are not that patient to deal with it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, typically a soft tissue injury takes up to a year, if not longer to fully heal. And you should not be back in a sport if you have one until after that. Yep. And three to four months later, people are like, how do I get back? Right. So really making sure that you take the time to heal that dog is really important and doing the exercises to do it. So how, how do you, especially sport people, right? Like how do you, emphasize your regular vet probably does not understand that portion yeah. of it. And and it's nothing against veterinarians, but I, so I say, it's like, you don't go to your general practitioner for a sprained ankle, right? They're going to refer you to an orthopedic facility, but vets are just supposed to handle everything that comes their way. And I find they miss most of the soft tissue stuff, unless somebody says right here, can you, and then really it's like a carprofen or something like that. So, so, I mean, is there, is there something you can share? Where is there a site somewhere? I know there's like a rehab vet, you know, uh, certification. So, so. I really, really encourage everybody to, um, and it can simply be done on your phone, is to record your dog walking, mm -hmm. running, and trotting all, you know, in a normal daily activity put them in, you know, a sit down and call them, put them in a stand and call them, just record them running around your backyard so that you know. And then, so I upload it on YouTube and slow it down to the slowest um, setting and truly watch each leg. And I watch it over and over and over um, until I know exactly what my dog's gait looks like on a normal day. So that if all of a sudden, like you're at Fast Cat or at nose work and you notice like, they lean up for a hide or, you know, jump or run, or you could, they come out of wherever you come out of the agility ring and you're like, wait, something's not quite right. Um, you can tell, and then you go home and record it again and you compare them. And then that's, you take them to the vet. The biggest thing I found is especially working for a vet and again, not knocking them whatsoever. Um, their entire flooring in that entire hospital is yep. tile. You yep. can't get a dog skate on a tile floor. Half of them are afraid of it. None of them are going to run on it. And if they are, they're going to slip. Um, so you having that information for your vet to see is really important. That's a really good question, Joanne. I was because one of the things too, we when we as trainers say, Oh, your your dog's a little chubby, you know, they unfortunately um your dog's a little chubby, and <laughs> the vet's like, Oh, he's fine. I'm like, uh, no. Uh, you know, that's interesting. Um, a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine that I work with, who is also a she's she went through the other program through Tennessee, and uh, um, she talked about like, and she's done extensive stuff because she does fly ball with her dogs. She said if you like take the palm of your hand and you rub across like this this part of it, mm -hmm. if you do that on your the dog's ribs, your dog probably has a little extra fat. If you take your hand and do this and go across the knuckles. This is probably just right. And this is too thin, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Like a lot of people, I think a lot of times people think their dogs are healthy when they probably carry a little extra poundage. Yeah. This is dive right yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> so those are, that's, you know, and I don't think, I don't think anybody really talks about that, but I also think there's a whole nother nutrition component to, everything we're talking about, right? I mean, yeah. it's the complete dog, so. So, Joanne, I, I know uh, Fire has... Uh, Partially torn cruciate, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> and um, and she, I mean, she, you seem to be handling it pretty 
uh, well, you know, um, was keeping her pretty fit, and, and, you know, and because of that, she's really. And this is this is the part I'm I'm, I'm trying to talk about because Joanne keeps her dogs pretty physically fit. She she does have an injured dog, but she's able to handle it right or deal with it in an in a easier way. I think with the cruciates, though, it depends, right? If they're partial tears, there's a lot of, um, like, because Simon had it too. But early on, when Simon was diagnosed with hip dysplasia, I went to Tops and had assessed what we needed to do. So we did the cookie stretches, we did the sit to stand, we did swimming, we did the incline sit to stand um, where he was facing me on the incline, and then the other side, working all that stuff. And um, surprisingly, he did pretty well considering he could still walk upstairs at 16, which was, you know, days, the same day he could, he, he ended up being um, put to sleep. He was still able to do that. But we did a lot of that stuff. We did a lot of the exercises and trying to build muscle, as you know. And um, I think that he ended up having a cruciate, a cruciate tear as well. And I remember him laying on the bed and screaming. I was like, oh my gosh, it just broke my heart. But we ended up re rehabbing it without actual surgery. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be done without the surgery. I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're working on, Joanne? Yeah, as long as it's not totally severed, yes. Right. Uh, and, you know, and the I went to a... Uh, I was going to say a reproductive vet. That is not what I went to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Gosh, we're making, anyway, it's a guy who does like stem cells and PPA and stuff like that. And so, you know, he was real honest. And he said, you know, the tear is much, he said, when I feel her, he said, it doesn't feel too bad. He said, but the x-rays came back way worse. So he said, I don't see that very often. Um, and so I was debating on like stem cell therapy to see if we could fix it that way and, and something like that. And he said, you know, once they're kind of gone, he goes, it may not go for her lifetime. It might go tomorrow. He goes, I just can't see charging you that much money, you know, without a guarantee. So anyway, but I, I think it's, it's important too. And I know since Tracy also does a lot of confirmation, Congratulations on Westminster, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, you know, this is my second border collie that's been really high in the rear. And so hmm. can you can you talk, Tracy, about when you have a dog that's not structurally correct, how much harder you have to work to keep everything together, right? But I think for some of those perfect dogs, it's like, eh, they just they just kind of do what they do. I mean, it's still worth it, but like right. The cheerleaders so, in high school. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a lot to it. I mean, when you're trying to get a dog to um, sit or stand, you know, in in what I would consider, you know, a square form, but they're not square, it is definitely more difficult. Um, I do a lot of, not a lot, but a, um, manual manipulation if they will let me. So I like back leg, like, say, you know, the dog sitting in the, um, um, hawks are outwards underneath them. So I will have, if it's not my dog, the owner lure them with a cookie. And I'm going to ask, obviously, if I can go behind, if the dog is okay with being touched. Otherwise I would, I would feed the treat and have the owner do it. And we're going to gently move those in and we're going to hold that for five seconds and we're going to fully release the dog. Um, and you're not going to be able to fix structure, but you can make a new memo, um, muscle memory to help that dog physically sit better or stand better. Um, so that way, when you are going out and doing these things, they are more aware of their body awareness and their balance in a dog. Like it is not structurally square or, or sound as if you're, you know, too high in the rear, um, whatnot, you're going to work a lot more on your balance and your body awareness. So they know exactly where their body is um, opposed to a square dog that might not have to, mentally keep that such track of that because their feet are going to land where they should. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So here's my question. I, um, as the dog develops, you know, from puppy to adolescence where they go through that little gangly. Yeah. <laughs> puppy uglies. Yeah. The puppy uglies. Um, 
you know, do you, how do you handle as they're maybe having a development, you know, as they're going through a growth spurt or something where maybe their sit might not be perfect? Do you still work on that or? You do a little bit. And it's, again, it's those three to five second muscle memory holds. You're not, I mean, you don't want them 15, 20, 30 seconds in that hold. You just want the little bit of muscle, muscle memory for like, oh yeah, that's, that should be where it is because they're still going to keep growing. They're going to come out of it 99% of the time, you know, depending Mm -hmm. on spay, neuter and all that fun stuff. Um, But you're, the object is to get them to sit as well as you can do a little bit of manipulation. And the next time when you go to ask them, a lot of times you'll see them correct it themselves or even, you know, a week later, if someone's been working on it all week, you know, and again, five to 10 seconds, three to five seconds, just have them hold it and then completely release them um, out of it. You know, toss a cookie and release. Don't lure and release because you want them to come out of it on their own. Mm. So could you explain on their, on their own, meaning that you're not manip- you're not luring them out. You're just tossing it. So they come up whenever. However- Correct. Just like you would release them out of, um, Stay. any other command you're looking to kind of release them out of. Um, I typically just toss a cookie behind me or to the side. Um, and then, you know, let them go get it on their own opposed to, well, I'm doing like my, um, my sit and downs. I do a lot more luring with a cookie because I want it to be nice and slow, very controlled so that they're using all their, um, muscles opposed to just a very quick sit down stand. Um, it's much different when we're trying to do it physically. So if you can imagine, you know, yourself going to the gym and the trainer's like, okay, do five, you know, um, I don't know, squats. Um, mm. But he wants you to do it real slow and controlled. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> That's very hard. I'm just Yeah, right. Well, it's it's a little hard for your dog too, honestly. <laughs> Depending on, you know, what, what level of <laughs> mm. what level you're at. I mean, when I when I started in and honestly, the it, it really depends on how food mo- food motivated your dog is too. Um, my miniature schnauzer, I have to freeze something on the end of a spoon for her to lick. I cannot have treats in my hand, or I won't get anything out of her. She is so food, 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 food. She will do anything to get the food. Whereas if I freeze some peanut butter on a spoon, she'll be like, "All right, I'll lick it. You can manipulate me. You can tell me, and I'll do this slowly." It's not as high value. Mm. Um, but yeah, being able to um, lure them and not get your fingers taken off is a great thing. Um, but but being able, truly being able to, you know, okay, I want you. And, you know, like Lisa said before you honestly, like, so I teach a tuck sit where their front feet stay planted and their back feet come in and underneath them opposed to them sitting backwards into the sit. Um, and then when they stand up, they're fully, you know, standing up out of it, their bet, their front feet are staying where they are and their back feet are kicking out. Kick back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, folding down, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then fold it when we do a down, you're folding down like an accordion with all, um, four legs at the same time. And we do that extremely slow and then we get up even slower and it's, it's a really good, like, it's a really good workout. It really is. You don't think you like, you're thinking, Oh, they're not doing much, but actually having to slow down and do that is doing way more than you think it is. Tell me about it. (laughs) Um, Tracy, uh, Elizabeth had a question, Tracy. Is there something that they can do in combination with physical therapy that they're already doing that you can do? Uh, Elizabeth, do you mean, or Liz, do you mean like exercises or other modalities? Because, you know, now we live in a time where we're able to do so many more things, acupuncture, Cairo, um, cold laser, underwater treadmill, all those kind of uh, things that can help depending on whatever situation you have going on with your dog. Um, So she said with physical... They can do in combination. So uh, I don't know if Liz means exercises or um, depending on what, uh, yeah, like fitness stuff in combo with uh, hydro laser and Accu. Yeah. So I guess her, I, I'm guessing she's asking for her older dog that might be doing physical therapy, like other modalities that you recommend that might be helpful. 
Um, so I'm a really big fan, and I'm not sure he has a uh, lower back injury, correct? Is that right? Or did? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so one of the things I really like for that is Cavaletti's on the lowest, the bars are on the lowest, if not just on the floor. I'm not sure you're, if you're doing that in PT or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, making, so at, at his age, it's a lot of um, body awareness and making sure he knows where his feet are um, to prevent injuring himself more and to keeping him um, moving. So stuff like that, um, honestly, doing your square sits and your down and your stand um, and doing them a couple, you know, I typically do mine, my routine of that um, before I feed um, dinner and breakfast every day. Um, uh, a lot of walking too, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I, just I mean, on, on like grass is what I remember saying. They talked about like different surfaces in a steady walk. So whatever. I mean, I have Lucas who has um, low back issues and um, I've been, I swim him with a life jacket. We just did it a couple of times today. We only do a couple of things because he's kind of Mr. Reckless Abandon. He, the other day he tried to jump the corner of the pool and like hit his head and I'm like, oh my God, stop. But if anybody knows him, that's who he always has been. Mr. I can do it faster and harder and quicker. Um, so like I've had to, really, yeah, Mr. <laughs> Reckless Abandon Gene. So, um, and so I do a little bit cause then when he comes out, he's all wobbly in my, and like, he likes to attack toys like in the water. And I guess he bit today, he bit my husband's hand. I'm like, well, don't put it in his face, you know, just <laughs> grab him and pull him around so he can swim. And he comes out and he's all like, woo, excited. And then next thing you know, he's running like a maniac. But, and I think that's the other thing we have to be careful of. It's like, there are some dogs that are more about how fast you want me to do it, how hard, how much right. the arousal piece is like, you know, and I think that's probably why he's more, um, injured because that's who he was and I didn't know any better until right yeah and so now it's like we do some walking and he's doing much better I've only done a little bit like I've done a short swim back and forth two times he comes out we walk and um and I've noticed a difference in just overall who he is but I remember um Denise Theobald who was from canine massage Chicago or uh, yeah. body works now she talked about like movement is the key to life and it's true right it's no different than any of us we have to get up and moving instead of sitting and watching tv you know because that does help all the circulation go through and so forth but mm -hmm. so tracy let me ask you and i know <laughs> joanne so if you have a dog like lucas and bam that are how quickly can we do it how fast can we what are some things we can do to help them kind of be aware of, you know, <laughs> where they're, because, you know, Bam tends to cut his paws all the time because he's, because he's Bam. <laughs> <laughs> and so, or dogs that tend to be pretty, you know, energetic and what are some things, you know, so I, to, what comes to mind is the lunge, lunging, right? Yeah. Or, or, or is that maybe too much for them? Um, I mean, it really depends on the arousal level of the dog, but um, lunging is <laughs> a, <laughs> I, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, right. Um, it really, <laughs> but I, I feel lunging is a great exercise. I use it quite often. Um, when I teach it, I put a um, row of cones um, around me. I stand in the middle and I have the dog on the outside of the cones. In every like fourth cone, there's a cookie on the cone and it really just gets them moving. And then eventually you fade out the cones and the cookies and they know what you want them to do. Um, <clears throat> but making sure you go both directions is actually really important because your dog always leads with one foot, not both. Um, most, well, I wouldn't say most, a lot of people don't know that, that their, their dog is very right or left sided. Um, so making sure you work both sides is very important. And that's in most of the exercises we do also. But um to touch back on what Lisa said, yeah, walking on the grass is definitely a great thing. Um, so dogs like Bam and, you know, that need more of that body awareness. So, 
you're you're gonna again start on the floor and you're gonna take you know a um a foot wide board or a two foot and a half wide board that's balance beam length and you're gonna lure them and walk it and you're gonna do that and then a smaller board and a smaller board and a smaller board um but again keeping it on the floor because if they missed up then they just missed up they're not hurting themselves and then we put um, them on the dog walk right okay <laughs> so and then we put them on the dog walk right <laughs> oh my God. and then you work up from there you know you you two three inches off the ground you know you really you have to work it because they have to learn where those feet are going to fall. And if they don't, they have to be able to catch themselves. Um, one of the biggest things on, you know, grooming for so long is how many dogs actually can't stand on a table that is two feet wider than what they're standing on. Um, just because they have no idea there's an edge there. They've never been taught that there's an edge there. Um, so that's a really, really good thing. And a really big thing. Um, body awareness is really important. Hmm. So, I have another question about this is like the controversial exercise, right? I'm just wondering what you think about it. Oh boy. Is, is, the, uh, <laughs> is the, you know, the, the sit up and beg the like balancing. So it is definitely um, what uh, we consider an advanced exercise. Um, it's one that I wait until your dog can prove they have core on a unstable object. So whether they can balance I say um, without luring because at some, at some point your dog will be like, they'll offer. I mean, you put names with everything you're doing, you know, they become, you know, different, almost types of tricks, if you will, uh, you know, putting themselves on different equipment or doing different things. But um, they, uh, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay, it happens. Advanced um, exercise is using their core. Thank you. Um, yeah. Once their front legs and back legs can be on separate unstable objects is when I would start then being able to ask them to do a sit up. And there's a lot of things and a lot of components that come into it. Are they sitting straight back? Are there, um, if they have a tail, where is that tail? And if they have a nub, where is that tail? Because Or where is that nub? Because you want it fully behind them for support whether it's a tail or a nub, um, you want to make sure that their hocks are flat on the ground, their feet are facing forward. And you're going to actually ask them to do more of a pause up on your arm multiple times and work your way up to that full sit before you actually get into the strength of a core to actually be able to sit there. And then it's only going to be three or five seconds and you're going to release them. From there, you can work up more time, but to get to there, it's, it's the process making sure that the dog has a core. Um, because if you have a, a longer back dog or um, a dog that is slightly longer than it is tall, or even, you know, your smaller dogs, everybody likes to, you know, the, do this sit pretty. Well, what happens is you have a cookie and it's over their head and then it reaches behind their head and all of a sudden they've flipped, twisted and tweaked their back trying to get it because they never had the core to stand up there in the first place. Um, or they don't, you know, they don't have the strength and they end up in injuring their lower back, um, from being up there too long or, uh, not having the stamina to actually do the exercise. So they flip out of it. Hmm. So do you find like people like for me, like things that I tell people are pool noodles or things that are smaller like that two by two, four, uh, two by four little boards to like teach them for Cavalettis and then, yeah. um, like yoga mats because they provide enough they're firm but yet not like you know good for balance and stuff to work on that and strengthening it are what other types of equipment do you recommend recommend for the non extremists <laughs> if that makes sense i'm sorry yes. i'm trying to i'm trying to be kind <laughs> um so you know how you have like gardening knee pads those are a nice inch thick cushion those were oh, wonders yeah. yeah um trying to think what i've used around here um you've done the, noodles. have you done like the foam noodle pads for yeah noodles, noodles are great for like cavalettis um and they're very inexpensive too yeah. they are dollar um, store dollar piece or dollar for like four or five of them yeah 
Yeah. I mean, you can even go to your, you don't need the cones. You can go to your local Home Depot, Lowe's Menards. They will cut PVC pipe that's, you know, a quarter inch or three quarter inch. And you can lay those on your ground, on the ground. Um, also, those are very inexpensive and you can get different lengths because then you can um, turn them and do different, you know, um, kind of figures with them. It's a little bit more advanced, but after you, you know, do straight down and back, um, you would alternate um, width and um, like either go in a circle or depending on how many you have, you can go in like a figure eight. Um, and what it does is it at certain ends, it either closes or opens the Cavaletti um, and giving your dog more body awareness to not step on it. Um, so let, thing. can you explain about the Cavalettis? I think um, people who have done this with horses, you know, this is a different story, but like, what is the ratio from the, like, what is the distance between Cavalettis based upon who the dog, what the dog's measurements are in terms of when you're starting. And then as you progress through, if you're building reach and drive. Um, so you're always going to start. So I, um, actually Amazon has a great set of, I think they're soccer cones with holes in them to be quite honest. With yeah. You. Yeah. They, yeah. I know. What you're uh, um, uh, so at the beginning we start with them on the ground without any cones whatsoever. Um, and then you're putting them in the first hole. You don't ever want the Cavaletti higher than the Hawk. Um, so that's a good point if for highness. Um, and again, you're going to gradually work from the floor on your way up as far as far away. Um, typically for like a large dog or um, so Jarvis is 25 and a half inches at the shoulder. Um, I usually have them about a foot, a foot and a quarter apart. Um, and that's just really based on his natural stride. So there's going to be a little bit of walking your dog, seeing if they're landing. The object is for your dog to land with its front and back feet in the middle between the Cavaletti. Um, so a little dog is, you know, going to be six to eight inches where a larger dog is going to be a foot, foot and a half. Um, when you start doing more endurance through them and doing it more of a, um, you know, high intensity warm up, you're going to put them farther apart, but then you're also, the dog's going to be able to more, um, trot through them or gate through them faster mm. and sometimes even higher depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So Mary wanted to know what stretches do you recommend and is there an area in the body that needs stretching more than the other areas? Um, so I really like cookie stretches, um, a couple of different ways you can do them um, or versions, I guess. I typically have um, my dog stand in a very stacked square position. I lure them with a cookie um, to the right, to the shoulder, and I hold it for a few seconds. And then I return to neutral. And then I go to the back of the hip um, and hold it for a few seconds and return to neutral. And then you do it the other way on the other side. Um, your neck and back, I like to put the front feet up on anywhere between two to four inches. Um, if you have more advanced dog or a bigger dog, it does help to put them a little bit higher. But again, um, you know, like if you have a back injury in a dog, you don't want them up very high or a back leg injury in a dog. Um, and once their front feet are up, you're gonna actually lure them up towards an angle towards like the corner of your ceiling. Um, and you can actually usually see in their lower back a little twitch and a, um, a little uh, ex, um, traction happen between that lower back muscle that you're stretching and then up in the neck also. And then to stretch downwards, um, you can either do a bow, a real nice bow, if, you, if they will go full flat um, with their front legs fully extended and their shoulders on the ground. Um, or, you know, for other sake, armpits are on the ground. Um, the other way to do that is to put their hind legs, flip of what you just did, put their hind legs up on the box um, and their front legs on the ground and luring them down towards the ground. We'll also stretch the back and the front. Oh, okay. How do you feel about the, like, down rocks? Like, stretch for the cookie from a down, for lower back. Um, for what? 
lower back, right? To stretch out yeah. the back end. Yeah, I really like it. And the more you can get the dog to hold it without a whole lot of twisting, which is why sometimes like something they can lick works a little bit better than them nibbling because you need them to hold it a little bit longer um, helps quite a bit just because you don't want their necks twisting. You want to make sure that their back is still level. There's no dip in the back. There's no arch in the back. Um, and either walking them out or in from what you're standing on would help um, flatten that out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my cat is like, he's ridiculous. So, and you guys, one of the things that you definitely want before you start any any physical exercises, double definitely double check with your vet um, that your dog is, you know, capable. Um, and, and depending on where you live, uh, if you can find a good rehab vet, that would be very helpful in, a, in addition to uh, your regular vet, right? Um, these days, um, a lot of vets work in conjunction with your regular vet, you know, the rehab vets work with your, um, with your regular vets. We are lucky we live in an area where we have a lot of them. Um, Lisa, in your area, there's, there's several right by you. No, just there's, a, there's a couple, right? There's a couple, but there's not. There's a lot more. So in Indiana, there's not. I don't think there's many opportunities as there is in Illinois. Mm -hmm. So join in my Yeah. Yeah, we have a great one in my area. And I know there's another one like in uh, Cedar Rapids. So and then, of course, in Des Moines, Geez, you have you have the university, so mm -hmm. yeah. And up here we have we're very fortunate. We're in you know the Chicago area. We have quite a few, uh, and they're all very busy um, mm -hmm. <laughs> because now. Well, here's the thing, you guys. Um, uh, Canine fitness is becoming a little more mainstream, as well as alternative modalities for dogs, um, like acupuncture, like underwater treadmill, like um, chiropractor chiropractic and all that. I know, um, I'll be honest, I, my dogs go to the chiropractor. My, I mean, now that I have, I have younger dogs, they go every, I don't know, six months or so um, to the Cairo. Um, Tango, uh, Tracy helped me with Tango. Um, my, my shepherd has had a weak rear because he had long hawks. So we ended up doing a lot of physical therapy. He does underwater treadmill um, twice a month. And and some and the exercises that uh, Tracy has prescribed for him now you'd never know his rear is weak, but it's it's part of the maintenance that we do uh, with him so he stays nice and strong because he's a very very large dog, and uh, want to make sure that as he get as he ages that he's going to still be able to you know have that like Lisa said all that movement um, as as long as possible so. Um, where my lab is uh, from a structural perspective, she doesn't have, I mean, for her, the big thing is exercise and keeping her a little bit more trim, which is very, very challenging because she likes to, she wants to be a confirmation lab really bad. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, and, 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 and going for a Cairo, the older your dog gets more often. Um, when Chacha was alive, she would go to the chiropractor every I don't know, six weeks because she was older and she needed it. Right. So touch real quick on the chiropractor and puppies though. It's actually really good as a puppy to get them adjusted. Sometimes, um, you know, it, they're oh. lashing out in ways that you don't even think of that is pain. Um, and it really just, they came out of the birth canal wonky or whatever, and they've just got a kink in their neck. And um, sometimes those early chiropractor adjustments actually are really, really good. Right. Yeah, ours here. She'll do free chiropractic adjustments for puppies under six months. It's mm. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, I, and I'll tell you, I um I assessed a litter of uh, Weimariners, you know, a few years ago, and I was like, bring that one back, right? And they're like, what's wrong? And I was like, like man, I said, I don't know. Either your dog can't see above its head, or something's weird. Like, and so they ended up taking it to the Cairo. And she said, you could hear the pop in the lobby. Like <laughs> that puppy shook off and was like, yeah, totally different, right? <laughs> so thank you. Thankfully they did that before they sent the puppy home. Right. I mean, could you imagine living like that? And um, I mean, Tracy said it right. Birth in and of itself is, is 
terribly tough on their bodies, even though they're little squishy things, right? It's really good to get them in right away, get them all aligned and get them growing right. Um, one of the things a breeder of mine know, does when before she sends home a litter of puppies is they all get adjusted like three days before they go home because, you know, she's noticed sometimes, you know, you've got a, one puppy in the litter is a little more feisty, let's, let's just call it that, but really they're just, you know, they're tweaked in some way and it really does help. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that, Cause I do, I take, I'm, I'm, you know, I do a lot of Cairo and all my, you know, my two young dogs that I have now have, you know, gone to the chiropractor. They started Cairo at a very young age. So, um, you know, they, cause I, I, I see the importance and it's like, it's so much more inexpensive that way than trying to fix a bigger problem. Absolutely. Um, later on. So I'm, I'm kind of all about that. It's like, let's, let's try to prevent this stuff before you, um, before you uh, make it worse. Um, anyway, so thanks Tracy for, um, coming tonight and talking to us about canine fitness. We, um, we're a big proponent of it. And, um, I know Lisa and Joanne are as well. And I am very fortunate to have you in my area because now we're going to, I really, we're trying to develop our, our program. We have a, an area and all as much equipment as possible and hopefully um, be able to do more programs and more and offer more things uh, at our, at the for your canine so that uh, we can keep everybody in, in good shape because it, it's really important and it's, it's a lot better to do, to do the work early than to wait until, you know, you have a problem, right? So Absolutely. Preventative is, prevention is key and keeping them fit and healthy, but just, it's no different than us, right? If we keep ourselves, I mean, my dogs are in better shape than I am, but I digress. Uh, and also <laughs> eat better than I do, but I control it. Yes. No, I have no control of what goes in my mouth. <laughs> I know. I know, right? Um, they, they are they are in a much better uh, situation, but trying to keep them healthy is just, because it, otherwise you're spending, you're going to eventually spend all this money trying to keep them healthy later on instead of just preventing some of the problems in the first place. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you all. Are uh, you looking for a Cairo? Any recommendations? Jodine, down in your area, check with um, Integrative in Homer Glen. Uh, in Homer Glen. And um, Tango, lie down. In Homer Glen, uh, Dr. Amber is really great. And, um, and there's a couple others down in your area. But email me and I'll send, them, I'll send you the information. On that note, we better wrap up before Nancy goes flying across the street. <laughs> Hey, I'm prepared this week. No, no. I'm prepared this week. I'm sitting up so you can't jump on me. So, uh, yeah, I, I will just tell you guys before we signed off, I don't think you two did, but I know that I shared it um, on my Facebook page, uh, which was the Things That Go Boom that we did last year um, before the 4th oh, yeah. of July. So we are going to we are gonna take next Sunday off, right? Yes. No, yes? Okay, yes. To, to observe 4th of July. So um, if you have a dog, uh, if you're new to us and you have a dog with, you know, noise phobias or something like that, go, please go check on our um, sites. You can find that video, will help you out, give you some ideas about um, what noise sensitivity. Yep. And so have a great uh, holiday, you all. Um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.